Okay, so we left off with um, Grayson telling Jeffrey that he always wanted to be a baseball player. So now we're going to start chapter 25. In the morning, Grayson bought Maniac an Egg McMuffin and a large orange juice. He bought the same thing for himself, so they ate breakfast together in the baseball equipment room. You sent me to bed without a story last night, Maniac kidded. Grayson brushed a yellow speck of egg from his white stubble. I don't got no stories. I told you. You wanted to be a baseball player? That ain't no story. Well, did you become one? Grayson drank half his orange juice. Just the miners, he muttered. Maniac yelped. The miners could never make it to the majors. There was a frayed weariness in the old man's words, as though they had long since worn out. Grayson, the miners? Man, you must have been good. What position did you play? Grayson said, Pitcher. This word, unlike the others, was not worn at all, but fresh and robust. It startled Maniac. It declared, I am not what you see. I am not a line-laying, pickup driving live at the Y, bean, bean brain park hand. I am not rickety, whiskered, warm, warm, uh, worm chow. I am a pitcher. So, Grayson is this old, uh, this old man uh, who seems like, a, you know, if you look at, we talked yesterday about the way he speaks. He's not the most educated guy in the world. He's, um, uh, he's an older guy. He he doesn't seem to have a lot. But at one time, there was something that he did very well. Um, if you don't know about baseball, you have the majors and the minors. The majors would be like the big leagues that you, that you see on TV, and the minors would be just kind of under that. But it is still professional. That means you get paid to play. And hopefully, if you're good enough in the minors, you eventually get to go to the majors, and that's where the big ball players go. Maniac had sensed there was something more to the old man. Now he knew what it was. Grayson, what's your first name? The old man fidgeted. Earl. Earl. But call me Grayson, like everybody. He looked at the clock on the wall. Gotta go. Grayson, wait. I'm late for work. You ought to be in school. He was gone. Grayson returned at noon, bearing zeps and sodas, and was not allowed to leave until he told Maniac one story about the minor leagues. So he told the kid about his first day in the minors with Bluefield, West Virginia, in the Appalachian League. Class D. Can't get no lower than that, he told the kid. That's where you broke in. Don't have D-ball no more. He told about thumbing a ride to Bluefield, and when he got there, going up to a gas station attendant and asking which way to the ballpark. And the gas station man told him, Sure, but first I gotta ask you something. You're a new ball player, right? Just coming on board? And Grayson said, Yep, that's right. And the man said, I thought so. Well, then, you're just going to want to make your first stop right over there. He pointed across the street. That there restaurant, the Blue Star. You just go right on in there and sit yourself down and tell the waitress you want the biggest steak on the menu. And anything else you want, too, because it's all on the house. The Blue Star treats every new rookie to his first meal in town free. He He gave a wink. They want your business. Great, thought Grayson, and he did just that. Only when he got up and left, the restaurant owner came running after him down the street, all mad at Grayson for skipping out. And when Grayson told him he was a rookie, just picking up his first free meal, the owner got even madder. Seems the gas station man was a real card and liked to welcome dumb rookies with his his little practical joke. And that's how it came to be that when the Bluefield Bullets took the field that day, They did so without the services of their new pitcher, who was back in the kitchen of the Blue Star restaurant doing dishes to work off a 16-ounce steak, half a broiled chicken, and two pieces of rhubarb pie. After a story like that, Maniac couldn't just stay behind, so he tagged along with Grayson when he went back to work. He helped the old man raise a new fence around the children's petting farmyard. When the park superintendent came round and asked about the kid, Grayson said it was his nephew come to visit for a while. The superintendent who managed the budget said, We can't pay him, you know. And Grayson said, Fine, no problem. And that was that. From then on, Maniac was on the job with Grayson every afternoon. They raised fences, mended fences, hauled stone, patched asphalt, 
painted, trim trees. They ate breakfast, lunch, and dinner together, sometimes in the equipment room, sometimes at a restaurant. They spent weekends together. All the while, Grayson told baseball stories, insisting all along, I ain't got no stories. He told about the Appalachian League and the Carolina League and the Pecos Valley League and the Buckeye and the Mexican Leagues, about the Paducah Twin Oaks and the Natchez Pelicans and the Jessup Georgia Browns and the Laredo Laureates, all minor league teams, minor league baseball. Sleazy hotels, sleazy buses, sleazy stadiums, sleazy fans, sleazy water buckets, curveballs and bus fumes and dreams, dreams of the majors, clean sheets and an umpire at every base. Funny stories, happy stories, sad stories, just plain baseball stories. The happiest story being the, the one about Willie Mays' very last at bat in the minor leagues before he went up to the New York Giants and immor- in, uh, immortality. Well, it was old Grayson himself who had last crack at Mays in the ninth inning of a game with Indianapolis. And what did Grayson do? All he did was set the, hey, uh, set the say hey kid down swinging on three straight curveballs. The saddest story was the one about the scout who came down from the Toledo Mud Hens. The Mud Hens had a roster slot, and the scout had a notion to fill it with the pitcher with the wicked curveball, name of Earl Grayson. So a scout, someone who comes, and they try to get somebody to see if they can get them to play for their team. This was Grayson's big chance, for the Mud Hens were class AAA ball, one short step from the majors. So if you make it there, you have a good chance of making it into the major leagues. The night before the game, Grayson spent half of it on his knees by his bed, praying. And even five minutes before the game, in the dugout, he bent down, pretending to tie his shoe, and closed one eye and prayed. Please let me win this ball game. Which was something, since he had never gone to a church in his life. God must have fainted, he said to Maniac. And indeed, maybe God did. Or maybe he only listened to major leaguers because Grayson took the mound and proceeded to pitch the flat-out, awfulest game of his life. His curveball wasn't curving, his sinker wasn't sinking, his knuckler wasn't knuckling, the batters were teeing off it as if it were the invasion of Normandy Beach. Before the third inning was over, the score was 12 to nothing, and Grayson was in the showers. He was 27 years old then, and that was the closest he would ever get to the big show. He hung on for 13 more years, a baseball junkie, winding up in some hot tamale league in in Guanajuato, Mexico, until his curveball could no longer bend around so much as a chili pepper and his fastball was slower than a senorita's answer. He was 40, out of baseball, and for all intents and purposes, out of life. All those years in the game, and all he was fit to do was clean a restroom or sweep a floor or lay a chalk line or, far, far down the road, tell stories to a wide-eyed homeless kid. Chapter 26 It was impossible to listen to such stories empty-handed. As soon as Grayson started one, Maniac would reach into one of the equipment bags and pull out a ball or a bat or a catcher's mitt, sniffing the, the scuffed horsehide aroma of the ball. Rippling, uh, rippling the fingertips over the red stitching. It's hard to say how these things can make the listening better, but they do, and for Maniac, they did. And of course, as happens with baseball, one thing led to another, and pretty soon the two of them were tossing a ball back and forth. And then they were outside, where the throws could be longer, and where you could play pepper on the outfield grass of the Legion field. The old man pitching, the kid tapping grounders, where you could shag uh, uh, fungos, the old man popping high flyers, and the kid chasing them down. So it starts off Grayson's telling him these stories, Maniac's kind of playing with a baseball or a bat or a mitt, and then before you know it, they're out on the field uh, playing ball together. And now the stories were mixed with instruction. The grizzled rickety coot showing the kid how to spray liners to the opposite field, how to get a jump on a long fly even before the batter hits it, how to throw the curveball, Stiff, crooked fingers that grapple clumsily with crimpette wrappers curled naturally around the shape of a baseball. With a ball in his hand, the park handyman became a professor. As to the art of pitching, of course, the old man could show and tell, but he could no longer do. Except for one pitch, the only one left in his repertoire from the old days. He called it the stop ball, and it nearly drove Maniac goofy. 
The old man claimed he had learned uh, that he discovered the stop ball one day down in the Texas League and that he was long gone from baseball when he perfected it. Unlike most pitches, the stop ball involved no element of surprise. On the contrary, the old man would always announce it. Okay, he'd call in from the mound. Here she goes. Now keep your eye on her, because she's going to float on up there, and just about the time she's over the plate, she's going to stop. Now, nobody else ever hit it. Sorry, he's talking. Now, nobody else ever hit it, so don't you go getting upset if you don't either. It's no shame to whiff on the stop ball, and then he'd throw it. Well, of course, Maniac knew that most, if not all, of that was Blarney, and just to make sure, he watched the ball extra carefully. There sure didn't seem to be anything unusual about it, not at first anyway, but as the ball came closer, it did somehow seem to get more and more peculiar, and by the time it reached the plate, it might just have well stopped, because Maniac never knew if he was swinging at the old man's pitch or at his speech. Whatever, in weeks of trying, he never hit out of the infield. It was October. The trees rimming the outfield were flaunting their colors. The kid and the geezer baseballed their lunch times away and the after dinner times and weekends. And every night as the old man left for his room at the Y, he would grouse, you ought to go to school. And one night the kid said back, I do. And that's how the old man found out what the kid was doing with his mornings. He had noticed the books before, rows and piles of them that kept growing, but there being books, he didn't think much of it. Now the kid tells him, you know the money you give me? Each morning he gave the kid uh, 50 cents or a dollar to get himself some crimpets. Well, I take it up to the library. Right inside the door they have these books they're selling, cases of them, old books they don't want anymore. The, they only cost five or 10 cents a piece. He pointed to the piles. I buy them. He showed them to the old man, ancient, back-broken math books, flaking travel books, warp spellers, mangled mysteries, biographies, music books, astronomy books, cookbooks. What's the matter, said the old man. Can't you make up your mind what kind you want? The kid laughed. I want them all. He threw his hands out. I'm learning everything. He opened one of the books. Look, geometry, triangles. Okay, isosceles triangles. These two legs, they look equal to you? The old man squinted. He nodded. Okay, but can you prove it? The old man studied the triangle for a full minute. If I had a ruler, maybe. No ruler. The old man sighed. Guess I give up. So the kid proved it. Absolutely dead center proved it. Two days later, while playing Pepper in the Legion infield, the old man said to the kid, so why don't you go ahead and teach me how to read? Okay, so we're about to start chapter 27. So far, Grayson has been taking care of Jeffrey. He's made sure he has money, food, a place to stay. He started teaching him baseball. Um, not just telling him stories, but teaching him how to play the game. And this is kind of a stereotypical thing but the idea that you should have in your mind if you kind of picture it is that grayson is taking on the role of a father to maniac uh, to jeffrey he's teaching him how to play baseball um and that's kind of considered it's a stereotype that means it's something that may not be true in every case, but traditionally it was always kind of a, a picture. You would see it on cards and posters of a, of a father teaching his son how to play baseball, playing catch with him. And Grayson is doing that with Maniac, uh, except he's teaching him how to really play because Grayson knew how to play really well. And now uh, Jeffrey has been getting all his books from the library and he's trying to uh, he's trying to get Grayson to look at them, and Grayson doesn't really seem that interested, and we realize it's because Grayson doesn't know how to read. Now that's not so common today, but back then, and say this is say this is the nineteen mid nineteen seventies, it's very possible for an older person to have been raised, to have went to school some, but to still not really be able to read very well. Um, and we still have people, we've talked about this in class, we still have people around here 
who uh, struggle to read. That's why we have uh, the literacy centers in uh, Leesville and in DeRitter to help people who just, they, they made it to adulthood, they went to school, but somehow they just never learned to read. So now Grayson, who's been taking care of Jeffrey this whole time, we're gonna maybe possibly see a bit of a reverse and Jeffrey helping Grayson out. So chapter 27. The story he told now was not about baseball. It was about parents who were drunk a lot and always leaving him on his own. About being put in classes where they just cut paper and played games all day. About a teacher who whispered to a principal just outside the classroom door, this bunch will never learn to read a stop sign. Right then and there, as if to make the teacher right, he stopped trying. The part I didn't tell about Bluefield, I was only 15. I ran away. The kid and the old man climbed into the pickup. They made three stops. First, they stopped by the park office at the zoo where Grayson told the superintendent he just wanted to work part-time for a while in the afternoons. Fine, said the superintendent, just so you don't expect to get paid full-time. Then they went to the library book sale racks and bought about 20 old picture books such as The Story of Babar and Mike Mulligan's Steam Shovel and The Little Engine That Could. Then they went to Woolsworth for a small portable blackboard and a piece of chalk. Within three days, Grayson had the alphabet down pat, the shapes, the sounds. After a week, he could read 10 one-syllable words, and he was reading them from memory. It took another couple of weeks before he began to get the hang of sounding out words that he had never seen before. The old man showed an early knack for consonants. Sometimes he got M and N mixed up, but the only one that gave him trouble day in and day out was C. It reminded him of a bronc, uh, of a bronc some cowboy dared him to ride in the Texas League days. He would saddle up that C, climb aboard and grip the pommel for dear life, and old C, more often than not, it would throw him. Whenever that happened, he'd just climb right back on and ride her some more. Pretty soon, C saw who was boss and gave up the fight. But even at their orniest, consonants were fun. Vowels were something else. He didn't like them, and they didn't like him. There were only five of them, but they seemed to be everywhere. Why, you could go through 20 words without bumping into some of the Shire consonants, but it seemed as if you, you couldn't tiptoe past the syllable without waking up a vowel. Consonants, you knew pretty much where they stood, but you could never trust a vowel. To the old pitcher, they were like his own best knuckleball come back to haunt him. In, out, up, down, not even the pitcher, much less the batter, knew which way it would break. He kept swinging and missing. But the kid was a good manager and tough. He would never let him slink back to the showers, but kept sending him back up to the plate. The kid used different words, but in his ears, the old minor leaguer heard, keep your eye on it, hold your swing, watch it all the way in, don't be anxious, just make contact. So Grayson is thinking about uh, tackling this like he would tackle being in, uh, a baseball player. And so he's imagining, you know, just keep your eye on it. Just, just keep looking at the, uh, the letters. Um, uh, uh, hold your swing. That means make sure you know what, uh, what sound to make. Watch it all the way in. Don't be anxious. Don't get nervous. Just make contact. So just say it out loud. And soon enough, that's what he was doing, nailing those vowels on the button, writing them from consonant to consonant, syllable to syllable, word to word. One day, the kid wrote on the blackboard, I see the ball. And the old man studied it a while and said slowly, gingerly, I see the ball. Maniac whooped, you're reading. I'm reading, yipped the old man. His smile was so wide, he would have to break it into sections to fit it through a doorway. Chapter 28. The first book Grayson read cover to cover was The Little Engine That Could. It took almost an hour and was the climax to a long evening of effort. At the end, the old man was sweating and exhausted. The kid's reaction surprised him. He didn't jump and yippy like he did after the first sentence. He just stayed in the far corner, seated on a stuffed and lumpy equipment bag. 
He had kept his distance all during the reading, letting Grayson know there would be no cheating. He had to do it on his own. Now he was just staring at Grayson, a small smile coming over his face. And now he was making a fist and clenching it toward Grayson, and he said, Amen. What's that? Amen. What's that for? Who prayed? I learned it in the church I used to go to. You don't have to wait for a prayer. You say it when somebody says something or does something you really like. He hopped off the bag, thrust both hands to the ceiling, and shouted, Amen. And suddenly the kid was hugging him, squeezing him with a power you never suspected was in that little body, unless you had seen him pull a baseball almost to the trees in dead center field. Okay, said Maniac, clapping his hands. What'll it be? I'll be the cook, whatever you want. Maniac had a toaster oven now, compliments of his whiskered friend. In fact, little by little, Grayson had brought him a lot of things. A chest of drawers for his clothes, a space heater, a two-foot refrigerator, hundreds of paper dishes and plastic utensils, blankets, a mat to sleep on, which the kid ignored, preferring the chest protectors. In time, the place was homier than his own room at the Y. How about a corn muffin, said Grayson, choosing something easy on his bad teeth and aching gums. Maniac went to the bookcase that served as a pantry. One corn muffin coming up. Toasted? Yeah, why not? Butter? Sure, butter. Something to drink that with, sir. Nah, muffin's enough. The apple juice is excellent, sir. It was a great year for apples. Live it up, thought Grayson. Yeah, okay, apple juice. Coming right up, sir. After the snack, the kid proved himself a good, as good a mind reader as a cook. Why don't you stay overnight, he said. It's late. While he groused about so preposterous an idea, the kid laid down the mat he never used, bulldogged him down to it, pulled off his shoes, and draped a blanket over him. He protested. This is supposed to be yours. The kid patted his chest protectors. I'm okay. I'm okay. And he knew that was the truth of it. The old man gave himself up willingly to his exhaustion and drifted off like a lazy, sky-high flyball. Something deep in his heart, unmeasured by his own consciousness, soared unburdened for the first time in 37 years since the time he had so disgraced himself before the mud hen scout and named himself thereafter a failure. The blanket was there, but it was the boy's embrace that covered and warmed him. When somebody does something you really like. Amen, the old man whispered into the cornmeal and baseball-scented darkness. So Grayson and Maniac are kind of becoming a little bit of a family. And we know from the last time this happened, Maniac kind of found a place with the Beale family. Then something happened. Now he's found Grayson. And Grayson, in a way, needed Maniac almost as much as Maniac needed Grayson. And now the two of them have become their own little family and they've made their own little home uh, in the baseball equipment room together. So we'll see what happens next. <laughs>